they said to me, do you want to use slides? I haven't used slides for 15 years. The last time I used slides, I ran IPPR. It's a think tank. And I did the slides the night before the launch of a massive report in front of an audience even bigger than yours, and it was live TV. And the first slide went up. I'd done it in a hurry. Uh, and it said, daft recommendations uh, of the IPPR Commission on Pubic-Private Partnerships. So um, <laughs> I don't do slides. <laughs> Carlotta talked about uh, decisions, decisions that we need to make. I'm going to talk about how we make those decisions, who makes those decisions. So a lot of you will care a lot about the environment. That's why you're here. It's your top priority, one way or another. And actually, uh, people who put the environment top of their priority list are sometimes ambivalent about democracy. Uh, they look at how slow democracies are, uh, how they duck difficult decisions. And sometimes they say to themselves, environmentalists, sometimes they even say publicly, actually, it's better that we have an authoritarian leader who does the right thing on the environment than democratic leaders who don't make decisions, who dither. Better a Chinese premier who is taking concerted action to tackle climate change than an American president who doesn't even believe the science. So it's tempting, if you really care about the environment, to say, well, democracy is a second order consideration. I want to say to you that you need to resist that temptation. I say that to you because I think we should want both a sustainable future, a better environment, a planet that's protected, and a society where the people who make decisions are accountable to us. I say that because I think that the climate change already happening is going to create conflict, challenges, resource shortages around the world, and the record shows those issues are more likely to be resolved by democratic regimes than authoritarian regimes. And I also want you to care about democracy because I believe if democracy decays as it looks as though it is doing in various places, it won't decay in a progressive environmental uh, direction. It will decay in a reactionary, problematic direction. So we should care about liberal democracy. But this is a very difficult time for liberal democracy. A very difficult time. We see the rise of populism. We see it in America. We see it in Italy. We see it in Hungary. We see it in Poland. We see it in Slovenia. And even in those countries that don't have populist governments, we see the rise of populist parties as the main opposition. And we see, if we look at opinion polls, that the disillusionment that people have felt towards politicians, political parties, and governments now seems to be going deeper into a disillusionment about democracy itself. More people in the West, even young people, saying they're not sure democracy is the best system, that maybe we need a strong person who can sort things out without having checks on their power. So this is a time to be worried about liberal democracy. And the generation that fought for democracy in the Second World War are dying. And so people don't have a sense of this is something they had to fight for. Now what's driving this? As people look at those opinion polls and they look at the rise of populism, they ask, why is this happening? We know it's true, we know it's real, we know it's worrying, but why? Why is it happening? And it happens for different reasons in different countries, but the kind of factors come up, the same factors come up again and again. Living standards comes up, the economy comes up. The fact that in this country, for example, we are experiencing the longest period of frozen living standards since the Industrial Revolution. We used to make a promise in this country, and the promise was if you worked hard, you'd be better off every year and you'd be economically secure. We no longer make that promise to millions of people. Another factor is globalization, the sense that forces beyond our control determine our lives, global corporations, people's worries about national identity, about migration. A third factor 
is technology. And we've heard from Carlotta the enormous possibilities of technology. But ask most people about technology, most ordinary people about technology now. And what they'll talk about is fear. They'll talk about the fact that robots are coming for their jobs. They'll talk about their worries about what technology is doing to people. And a fourth factor, which comes up again and again when you look at what's going wrong with our democracies, is social media. Is the fact that we have political discourse taking place through a set of platforms and processes almost designed to stop people talking to each other and instead to talk to people who agree with themselves. And so the one thing we know about social media is it doesn't really change your mind, but what it does do is if you have an opinion, it makes you believe that opinion even more strongly. It makes you have even less sympathy for people who don't believe in that opinion. It makes you more willing to mobilize behind the views that you already had. Now those issues, how it is we make technology work for people, how it is we tame certain elements of globalization, give people a sense uh, of agency, what it is we do about social media, how it is we get the economy back on track so ordinary people's living standards can increase. These are all difficult issues. But none of them are going to go away. Not anytime soon. So if these are the things that are driving the rise of populism, if these are the things that are driving people's disillusionment, people's willingness to consider alternatives to democracy, then the future looks, if anything, bleaker. It looks worse because those things that are driving that are going to continue. So what do we do about this? Well, a lot of people are reflecting on it. There's an explosion in books about the crisis facing liberal democracy. And some people say, well, Maybe it's a good thing. You know, maybe the elites need shaking up. After all, when we had the kind of consensus, the Clinton, Blair, Schroeder consensus, we didn't tackle inequality, we didn't really tackle climate change. You know, populism is a, a shock to the system. The system needs to be shaken up. You know, things couldn't get worse. I don't agree with that. I think things could get much, much worse. And the thing about populism is, yes, it's popular. It's popular because it promises the earth. But as Colotta said, it doesn't really tend to deliver that. And what often happens is when populists don't deliver on their promises, then you see their true nature. Then you see the authoritarianism come out. So I think it's complacent to say, well, this is just a shock to the system. The elite needs to be shaken up. There's another view. And this view is, well, look, you know, most of the history of the human race, we haven't had democracy. It didn't last for that long in ancient Greece. Maybe it's just going to fade out. Maybe we don't need democracy in the way that we did in the past. Maybe we can get on with things in other ways. But my question then is, who's going to make the decisions that Colotta was talking about? If democracy goes, where will the power lie? And you may hate politicians, but do you want the world run by Mark Zuckerberg? Do you want the world run by Jeff Bezos? Is that your vision? So, you know, democracy must change, but if democracy fades, it won't be that there isn't any power, it'll be that the power lies with people who are not accountable. So I want to suggest to you a third perspective, a third way of thinking about this challenge that we face, the challenge to the future of liberal democracy. And what I want to suggest is, well, it's a bit of a humdrum solution, really. It's Maybe a bit boring, I've only got six minutes to go, so you'll just have to put up with it, to be frank. <laughs> I want to argue that we should keep the foundations of the representative democratic system. That is a system that has, after all, delivered us enormous progress. It is still, despite everything, better to be alive now than at any other time. So I think we should keep those foundations. I don't think we should be pleased to have them swept away. I don't think we should be complacent. I think we should keep them. But we need to build a different structure on top. And so I'll tell you a couple of things that I think we urgently need to do if we are going to save and revivify our democracy. The first is we have to devolve more power. All across the world, mayors are more popular than presidents and prime ministers. If you go to America, state government poisoned Federal government poisoned, but yet in cities, mayors get on. 
They don't have the same sectarianism. They just get on. They do things. People prefer local power. When there's a blizzard, national politicians set up a committee. Local politicians get out a shovel. When there's a problem, national politicians spend years passing a law. Local politicians get entrepreneurs, charities, communities into a room and say, what can we do to make our city better? So the first thing we should do is develop power. And don't forget, who was it who led on climate change when the nations were dithering? It was the mayors all around the world. It was the mayors who moved first. And many of in the innovations that we want started and have started in cities. But the second thing I think we need to do is we need to bring deliberation into the heart of our democracy. You see, I think part of what's gone wrong is this, that representative democracy has got fundamental flaws. Now, we papered over those flaws. When it was bringing home the bacon, when we were getting better off every year, we didn't kind of mind, we put up with it. But now those flaws are intolerable to us. And the first flaw of representative democracy, the system that we have here in most of the West, is that it provides an incredibly blunt mandate. You know, we're used to having choice. We're used to making choices all the time. And here we have a system where every five years, you know, we get to choose a group of people who will then make all the decisions for us. Now, imagine this. You, maybe you like your supermarket. Imagine if we had an election every five years for our favorite supermarket, and the one that won with 30% of the vote was the one you had to go to every week, and they could decide what to put in your basket. You would hate supermarkets. Right? So representative democracy is an incredibly blunt mandate. That's the first problem. The second problem is this. The second we elect someone as a representative, in a sense, they cease to be representative because they become full-time politicians. And full-time politicians are kind of different people. They are, for example, terrified about activists in their own party. And I can tell you, party activists are a strange group. I mean, I've been one most of my life. Party activists are strange people. So the second we elect somebody as a representative, in a way, we're right to say they no longer are a representative of us. They're a different race. They're professional politicians. They live in a different world. It's not a very nice world, to be honest, but that's the world they live in. So that's why I think the second thing we need to do is we need to bring deliberation to the heart of our decision-making. And it works. So I'm talking here about things like citizens' juries, where you gather together 24, 30 citizens, you bring them together for two or three days, you give them a, a challenge. Should we legalize cannabis? Should we bring in road pricing? What do we do about the funding of social care? And these experiments have been used all over the world, from Ireland to Australia. And you know what happens? It turns out ordinary citizens are brilliantly capable of making clever decisions. Ordinary citizens are very capable of reaching a consensus. Ordinary citizens start off saying that they are terrified, they can't do it. At the end of the three days, they say, that was wonderful, I want to do it again. It works, it works, but we keep it at the margins. And I want to say we need to bring deliberation to the heart of things, because it will help address those two problems. It will provide politicians with a mandate for doing tough things. I'm not saying that you devolve the decision to the citizens' jury, but it can enable a politician to get up and say, look, this tough thing I'm doing, introducing road pricing, banning plastic, whatever it might be, I'm doing it because we asked ordinary citizens, people like you, and they said we should do it, and so we're going to do it. We've got a fresh mandate. And also it means that those citizens, in those citizens' juries, they are representative. They are like us. They haven't turned into professional politicians. What is the one institution in our society that hasn't been subject to reputational assault in the last few years? It's the jury, because the jury has this beautiful, simple idea that we all hear when we hear a verdict, even if we didn't expect the verdict, we think, well, if I had listened to the evidence, I would have reached the same conclusion too. So we need to bring deliberation to the heart of our system. And the good news is this. When you undertake deliberation, certain things, because we've done it all around the world, the problem is we just do it at the margins, we need to bring it to the heart of things, the same kind of things turn up. So if you ever discuss criminal justice in a, in a citizen's jury anywhere in the world, people go in as daily mail readers and they come out as guardian readers because they get to know the facts. <laughs> Secondly, if you have a citizen's jury anywhere in the world, people go in saying it's all the government's fault and they come out saying it's tough for government but actually it's a bit to do with us and how we need to behave. And thirdly, if you ask citizens to reflect on a long-term challenge, they are much braver than politicians in saying we need to act for the long term. So not only is it the case that if we brought deliberation to the heart of government, that we could revive democracy, we could renew democracy, but I also think 
it would be a space where we could make the kinds of decisions we need to make to create the world we want, take advantage of the opportunities that Carlotta so brilliantly described. Thank you.